Welcome, everyone. Uh, we'll wait a few minutes, um, but thank you for joining us today. I know there's a lot of options uh, for a uh, Wednesday, uh, and, and I'm glad to see that there's so many um, participants who are calling in from all over, which makes us feel really good um, about uh, the reach of our programs. Sorry, I'm adjusting a little bit here because it's... So we had actually an incredible um, response to this talk. Mark Johnson, you, you obviously have a very big fan following. Uh, yeah, I'm looking at some of the attendees and I see some familiar names. So it's good to, good to reconnect from around the world and, and a lot of new names who apparently are, are interested in the Chinese experience in Montana, which is great. It's, it's so great. And, you know, and it's, and I know that, you know, usually my mom calls a lot of people to have them hop on and, and she was busy. So she didn't call any of these people. <laughs> so this is all you, Mark. Um, but it's so good to see uh, friends. And, and I know a lot of these, we have both um, uh, people who are interested in their personal ancestries, but those who do this as a form of scholarship on the call. Uh, so welcome everyone. And we'll just give it one more minute because there was such an interest in this talk. And the great thing about uh, what we're doing today is we're going to be continuing uh, the theme of some of Mark's um, work and scholarship. And we'll tell you a little bit about that as a follow-on conversation um, that we'll have in a live in-person when Mark will be with us. Um, and that'll be in November. So look forward to that as well. And please you know, share, share all of our programs with others uh, and, and no pressure. There are a lot of really smart people on this call who know a lot about, the, about Chinese Americans and Asian Americans and history, but this book took you 10 years uh, for my uh, reading. So you definitely have the depth of the Montana and Chinese Americans. So I, I will say, I hope it didn't take 10 years for you to read it. I mean, no. to write it, right? It's, it's, it was not, it was a page turner, as they good, say, good, good. Um, even though it's University of Nebraska Press, I'm sure it's one of the, you know, most, uh, the, 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 the a page turner in, in their mix of, uh, of, of uh, published works. And um, so we'll start right away. Thank you so much for joining us. And thanks for Neil Will Gibbs for um, helping us organize it on, on our side. Um, I'm Nancy O. I have the real pleasure and honor of serving as a president of the museum. And you know, we're trying to do a lot more of these programs where we can um, access scholarship over, all over the country and all over the world uh, to sort of broaden the understanding of what Chinese and American experience, but also the current scholarship and also to really illuminate the lack of scholarship in a lot of areas. And Mark's gonna share a lot about that today with us because of the arduous process in which you went through uh, to create this incredible piece of work. Um, so Professor Mark Johnson, uh, he looked through many primary resources. Um, he translated, there was a lot of translation involved, um, but right now you hang your hat in a number, you're going on a, quite a book tour uh, with your work, and we'll get to know a little bit more about uh, where you started in the conversation we have, because we also want to get to know Mark, because um, I think some of his personal experiences led him to uh, this work. It's hard to go through all of the dense uh, paragraphs within the book, so I really recommend that you to purchase it. Um, it is called The Middle Kingdom Under the Big Sky. How long did it take you to think of that title? You know, it just came to me. Uh, Big Sky State, where I'm here in in Montana and, and the Middle Kingdom, I thought it was a nice coming together of two metaphors for the two places that uh, the book features. It's it's such a perfect title. Um, and it, the subtitle is A History of the Chinese Experience in Montana. Uh, we've done a lot of research and let's just kick it off. We'll talk a little bit about how difficult it was for you to come up with some of these primary resources, um, the challenges you faced. But stepping back even from that is what was the inspiration for the book? Thank you, Nancy. I just want to thank you and MOCA to be featured by this, by, by one of the most important museums in the world. And in terms of telling this important story, that the experience of Chinese Americans and the Chinese American communities, so happy to be able to tell a little piece to that. You know, a lot of times when we focus on the Chinese experience in America, we focus on the coasts, LA, San Francisco, New York, obviously important and need to understand that in more depth. But I'm trying to tell a little bit different story here. It really, the inspiration came, I'm, I'm from Montana, born and raised in Montana, you know, studied history when I was growing up here at Carroll College in Helena, Montana. But then I wanted to get out and see the world a little bit. So my wife and I moved to Shanghai, China in 2007. And I was teaching history there, history, English, different subjects at a school called Concordia International School, Shanghai. Uh, 
wonderful students, wonderful families, wonderful community. And I was teaching a couple of American history sections. Most of my students were Asian American. And so I thought, let's teach American history through an Asian American lens. And so I tried to kind of uh, put a different spin on it to try and meet them where they were at and get some motivation and buy-in and relevance to what we were studying. So what I would do is spend the academic year in Shanghai and then spend each summer back here in Montana. And when I was back here in Montana, I was searching around to try and find a hook, an interesting way in to try and do just that, tell interesting stories for my students. And uh, in the summer of 2010, came across some elements of this story that are detailed in chapter one. It's, it's a murder mystery with, um, you know, a Chinese man in, in Helena, Montana in 1870, gets in an altercation with a white miner, shots are fired. I'm intentionally using the passive voice in terms of who was to blame, right? The Chinese man goes on the run and is caught and lynched about seven days later. And so trying to, my students in 2010, we started the year with that. And it was fascinating and they were just so engaged, so intrigued by this. And what we would actually do, I had partners at the Montana Historical Society sending us resources and answering questions. So high school students in Shanghai in communication with researchers in Helena back and forth throughout, I thought it would be a week maybe. Turns out it drove a lot of that year. And the excitement of my students when I would tell them we got another email from the Montana Historical Society, they'd be rushing to my history class to figure out, you know, did they send the census records or did they give us more primary sources that we could dig into? So it was one of the most inspiring experiences as a teacher to see students hooked and motivated and struggling through the hard work of historical research, but doing it with joy because it felt important. In the span of that, so we kind of came to some conclusions on that first murder mystery and, and what happened. And, and we think we know about as much as we could know about that. The next summer, I was back at the Montana Historical Society. And I thought, hey, do you have anything in Chinese, Chinese language that you don't even know what it is? Because nobody here in Helena, Montana speaks or reads Chinese. I'm exaggerating, but only a little bit, right? In 1870, Helena was 21% Chinese. Nowadays, uh, it's not the most diverse place in, in the United States, right? And so they went through their archives, the Montana Historical Society, and what emerged was a box of documents, all in Chinese, about 100 letters, some bills, some um, accounting books, some prescriptions, but mostly letters. And I thought, great, this is fascinating. They didn't know anybody who read Chinese. I thought I knew a lot of people who could read these letters. And so I thought this is going to be an easy lift. We're going to translate these letters and tell the story of Montana's Chinese in their own words. Problem was, when I communicated with my Mandarin teachers back in Shanghai, they could only read about 30% of these letters. They were written in a difficult to read calligraphy and also written in the traditional script. It had been simplified since then. So most of my Mandarin teachers learned simplified writing and couldn't unlock these. So I thought, well, there's still a story here. Let's work hard to try and get this done. There had been one attempt to translate these letters back in 1988. A linguist working at the University of Montana was presented with a couple of samples of these letters. He read them and said, they deal with family affairs. They are of no historical import. After the long process of having these letters translated, I agree with them on the first part. They did deal with family affairs, a family back in Taishan County, Guangdong province, southern China, writing to uh, one of their sons and brothers working in Butte, Montana. So the family affairs were definitely what they focused on. I disagree with that linguist on the second count. I do think they are truly historically important and they help us understand the, the motivations of the people who came here to the American West, also the obstacles and the struggles that they faced. So that's a long introduction, but those letters were, were the heart of what became a pretty interesting process to try and translate these. So the first Chinese um, supposedly entered Montana around 1860, early part of the 1860s. And for those of you who missed it, um, Mark said 20% of the Helena population was Chinese. So from just reading around, it seems like their total population is around 3,000. So we're looking at 650 Chinese living in Helena in 1870. Um, and, and that's a significant population, again, 20%, even though right now you wouldn't necessarily think of it. I think after your book, or maybe during the process of doing this book, it seems like um, two things really unfolded. One, so many primary resources that you made accessible. And to be honest, the museum has heard time and time again, 
that wasn't really of value, right? Mm -hmm. The founders of the museum, Jack Chen and Charlie Lai have told those stories that people didn't see the value in the, you know, the genesis of the collection that we have today, which we now realize is exceptionally val valuable. Um, so I I'm wondering when you're looking at these primary resources, you're really a pioneer in all of this space. And you've kind of put the story on the map in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, just looking back at some of the Helena, um, the collateral that kind of is out there about the city, they're very proud of that um, Chinese heritage and those legacies. But can you just share a little bit about why were they in Montana? I mean, there were opportunities. And we think a lot about the early Chinese and how enterprising they were. Mm -hmm. um, could you tell us a little bit about how they move sectors, which you kind of allude to in the book? Yeah. Yeah, good question. You mentioned Jack Chen. He actually came and spoke at Concordia International School Shanghai when we were doing some parts of this project. So it was just worlds worlds coming together. Um, yeah, so the Chinese who came to Montana came in the, in the early 1860s, as early as we know. And that's really when the world was coming to Montana. Obviously, there was an indigenous population, rich cultures and peoples here before precious metal strikes. But with the, the gold strikes in Virginia City, Alder Gulch, Grasshopper Gulch, places like that, it was part of the overall gold rushes throughout the American West. So the same Chinese miners who tried to come and, and make it to Gold Mountain in, in California, then went to Colorado, Idaho, uh, Nevada, as precious metal strikes were happening. Same thing happened here in Montana. Unfortunately for them, they were pushed out of mining here in Montana pretty quickly. Now, there was an 1872 law that made it difficult for them to own mining claims. They definitely mined after that, but... Um, the, the initial attraction of precious metal strikes and placer mining, you know, panning for gold definitely is what drew many of them here in the 1860s and 70s. By the 1880s, 1890s, they weren't really working in mining in most parts of the state. Now, the Northern Pacific Railroad in the 1880s and 90s, they definitely helped construct that. So the traditional jobs that we often think of for the Chinese in the West, gold mining and railroad working, absolutely. What happened though in Montana, I try not to tell that story too much because I think that story has been told pretty, pretty thoroughly. So instead, they were pushed out of many occupations by law or local custom, intimidation, boycotts, and things like that. So basically, the Chinese in Montana worked as laundry workers, restaurant workers. Butte, Montana has what is purported to be the longest continuously operating Chinese restaurant in America, the Pekin Cafe. It's quite an institution. So they work as cooks, dishwashers, restaurant workers, some merchants, definitely um, gardeners, uh, vegetable gardening was a very important part of their role here in Montana. So I try to tell those stories more than the traditional gold mining and railroad working. You know, that, that's so interesting. And, and, and in a lot of ways, we think back around the limitations uh, for Chinese Americans at that time. Exclusion Act, many of the people on this call know 1882 is, you know, surfacing uh, in California after the railroad's been completed um, and just continuing to move around. And, and we also see that there are these um, uh, strongholds in communities over this period of time where they, they were like a lot of Chinese Americans would enter not just that um, that, that, that sector, if you will, restaurants, laundry, and, and uh, other aspects, but also that there were defined places that would hire them. Yeah. Um, and that's continued throughout the 250 year history where you see a lot of um, companies, you know, even in the 70s and 80s and 90s that were very receptive. It's almost like, oh, they'll hire you. Um, but I want to talk a little bit about um, some of the boycotts you alluded to just in your comment now. Um, 1905-06, a lot is happening in the early part of the 20th century Montana. Tell us a little bit about um, the, the conditions in which um, the Chinese are living in Montana. One of the, the tools used by anti-Chinese forces in Montana and across the West was an attempt to boycott the Chinese. So even those few um, professions that they were allowed to take part in, oftentimes when economic conditions were difficult, anti-Chinese forces tried to push the Chinese out of even those. So for instance, restaurants were often boycotted, laundry workers were often boycotted, and it wouldn't just be uh, through kind of a community-wide, like let's not patronize the Chinese. The Chinese would often uh, take laundry to patrons throughout Butte, for instance, throughout Helena, Missoula. And when the boycotts got bad, what would happen is walking delegates, so-called toughs, would follow the Chinese on their route and either try to physically harass them or go to the whites who were patronizing Chinese and basically put the strong arm on them saying, don't, don't 
patronize these Chinese, don't give American dollars to these foreigners, right? Now, foreigners, Butte, America, Butte, Montana is made up of almost entirely immigrants. And so, you know, the Irish, the Finns, the Italians, the Czechs were making a go of it there in Butte. The Chinese thought we are immigrant workers too. We want to work hard, put our head down and, and contribute to society. But that racism that was throughout the American West was often under the surface of any of these boycotts. The, what, the first boycott that we have evidence of is in 1866 in Helena. And it's also the moment where we get the first voice from the Chinese in Montana. One of the goals of this with the translation of the letters, but with every step of this project is to tell the story of Montana's Chinese population in their own words, or at least through their own cultural perspective. And I assert that the first time we hear their own words is an 1866 boycott, when in Helena, they, there was about 20 Chinese owned laundries and anti-Chinese forces, white forces, tried to push them out with uh, intimidation campaigns to get others to stop patronizing them. And that the Chinese laundry workers actually took out an ad in the local newspaper. And they write, we have at all times been willing to abide by the laws of the United States and are now willing to deport ourselves as good law-abiding citizens of, citizens of Montana territory and ask but that the protection of the liberal and good government this country permits us to enjoy. We pay all our taxes and assessments and only ask the good people of Montana may let us earn an honest living by the sweat of our brow. It turns out it worked. That boycott dissipated and the Chinese laundries were able to continue earning. Um, what they say though is we are uh, good law abiding citizens of Montana territory. Many people on this call know that that simply was not a legal truth. Chinese were not allowed to become American citizens until 1943. The only way that somebody of Chinese ethnicity, that's an exaggeration to say the only way, but for the most part, the only way that a Chinese family could become a Chinese American family was to be born here. That became exceedingly difficult because in Montana, the gender imbalance was extreme. 40 Chinese men for every one Chinese woman. Legally imposed difficulties for Chinese women to come to Montana, come to the American West, and then also legally difficult for Chinese men to wed anybody outside of their ethnicity. From 1909 to 1953 in Montana, there's what was called an anti-miscegenation act where the Chinese could not marry outside of their race. So throughout all these difficulties, they're saying, we wanna contribute, Here's we're, we're following all the laws, we're paying our, our taxes. Sometimes they were let, let alone to contribute. Oftentimes they were boycotted, intimidated. Thankfully in Montana, Violence did not emerge to the level of the Rock Springs massacre, for instance, in Wyoming, or the expulsion from Tacoma and Seattle in 1885. I think that threat of violence was always under the surface. Thankfully, in Montana, it did never rise to that level of bloodshed. I know there are probably a thousand questions percolating. You know, please feel free, um, all the participants, to put your questions in the chat, and I'll I'll integrate them as as I see fit. You know, it sounds like forty to one, um, and actually, nineteen thirties in Chinatown, New York City, as a comparison, Scott Seligman writes in the Tongue Wars, it was a, a similar proportion. It was about four thousand uh, to about thirty. Um, you know, in, in in the in the population here, and it, and it's it's interesting. This is right after the boycotts you talk about is right after the Geary Act of eighteen ninety two. Um, and, you know, you, you mentioned um, the gentleman who is considered the leader of the Butte uh, Chinese. Um, and I'm wondering, there's, there's really this um, very significant um, section in, in chapter three that you talk a little bit about the activism. Yeah. Um, and we think about that as a thread in the whole 250 year history of Chinese in America. We feel it differently today than we did, but we, we, we acknowledge it that there has been um, under such conditions that are Again, very unknown to the general US history student, um, but we know that they exist and your scholarship helps to really broaden that narrative to make it more accessible. But this activism, can you talk a little bit about how the Chinese Americans organized? Um, that is a very um, diplomatic um, you know, statement um, and one that is you know, recognizing that there are limitations with this life in this, in this place. Can you talk a little bit about how um, the Chinese Americans organized this leader you, you referenced and also about activism? Um, yeah, you know, that, that 1866 moment where they fought the boycott in Helena is, is a moment of activism. It's them standing up and saying, no, we have a right to be part of this society. We are following the laws. We're going to resist what you are trying to impose upon us. So there's that moment of activism from the very start where it really 
comes to the fore, though, is in 1892, exactly as you mentioned, the 10 year anniversary of the enactment of the Chinese Exclusion Act. It is reasserted with what's called the Gary Act. I know many on the call know its details, a much tougher Chinese Exclusion Act with the enforcement of a certificate that each Chinese person in America needed to carry upon their person with their photograph affixed to it. One a certificate that they basically had to have on their person at all times, and then one registered with state agents. And the Chinese in the West and throughout the nation said, we don't know, we, we've done nothing wrong. It really is trying to take the Chinese Exclusion Act from the ports and borders and move it into the interior and almost make simply being of Chinese ethnicity illegal. The only people to that point who were forced to be photographed were criminals. And now you're forcing this group that had legally, for the most part, gotten into the United States, had done nothing in the span to become illegal. And now you're, you're imposing upon them this uh, intrusion of this certificate with a mugshot. And so the Chinese in Montana and other places fought against this through strategic noncompliance. They simply dragged their feet and did not register with the Gary Act in 1892 as the law stated. And so by the time it was due to go into effect, so few of them had registered that if the government were to actually enact the strictures of the Gary Act, it would have gummed up the system to the point of, of just making it impossible. Now, the Chinese six companies, Chinese Benevolent Association, fought against the Gary Act in a test case uh, with the Supreme Court. It lost, right? And so the Gary Act was due to go into effect with the McCrary Amendment in 1893-94. Um, but even then, Montana's Chinese fought through st strategic noncompliance. They dragged their feet. The McCrary Amendment was supposed to go into effect May 4th, 1894. Montana's Chinese, 40% of them waited until the last day to register for this. And so there's they're saying something by that strategic noncompliance. They're saying something that says, we are fighting for this. We feel like we have a voice and we're going to stand up for ourselves. Eventually, they did have to register, uh, but I think they sent a strong message. And then more locally in Butte, Montana, it, Butte's always had the largest Chinese population in Montana at about 1,000 in 1890. Sometimes you'll hear a lot, much larger number for that. I think that's a confused statistic. So Butte's Chinese population was about 1,000 in 1890. A major boycott was instituted against them in 1896-97. The Butte Chinese fought it in court, won an injunction. The Chinese six companies had actually told them, don't fight this. Keep your head down. You're, you're not smart to go against American labor unions. Don't fight it. When the Butte Chinese won this injunction, the six companies wrote and said, the Butte Chinese are the, the smartest of any Chinese in America. <laughs> and they stood up. They used the American legal system. This gentleman, Quan Loy, who you mentioned, was considered the, the unofficial mayor of Butte's Chinatown. And he was a go-between between, between the, the white government and the Chinese community, often agitating and advocating for his people in very empowered ways. And, and uh, Mark references six companies. I think most of the uh, folks on the call know that that was the precursor to the Chinese Consolidated Benevolent Association. And often the head of the CCBA is sort of the default mayor of the Chinese American community. Um, and that in and of itself, the CCBA history is such a treasure trove of uh, Chinese American history. So that's something that we'll definitely try to break down um, more and more um, in, in the programs that we do. So, you know, we talk a little bit about, um, oh, there are a couple of questions here. You know, Ms. Zhou, thank you. She says, you know, the Chinese filed over 10,000 lawsuits to challenge discrimination. Yep. Do you, could you want to reference a little bit of that, what was happening? And and there was, you know, obviously there's Wang R. Kim happening um, in, in the U.S. at this time. Um, and then subsequently, there's constant battle with challenging legislation um, yep. and making a life. Yeah, and I think many people on this call know that activism. I think a broader American public when studying American history isn't presented with that activism. And a lot of times the Chinese in the American West or across the nation are seen as a colorful backdrop. And, and, and what people fixate on is the exotic. They fixate on Chinese prostitutes, on opium dens, on supposed Chinese tunnels. I get those questions everywhere I go and speak. And I want to try and uh, get away. There's some truth to opium use, prostitution, things like that. But I think it's overblown. And instead, through this activism that's mentioned by the commenter, we can see them as motivated, as collaborative, as organized, as intelligent, as strong, and begin to see them as fully formed historical actors rather than an exotic backdrop to the telling of the American West. Mark, why? 
Um, actually, you know, we know a lot of the more contemporary Hollywood fetishization, creation of stereotypes. Um, and obviously there's, there's a language barrier. We've mentioned that a lot at the museum, that there was an opportunity to really tell the story. And, and in fact, people kind of kept low because who knows what's going to happen when you think about uh, people who are, don't have citizenship and are undocumented for the instances. But why is the history of Chinese American, in your opinion, having gone through this 10 year you know, um, work, why is it so um, off the mark in terms of people's understanding of the depth and nuance of it? I think it's complex. I think um, to understand the experience of the Chinese migrants who, who made the West, made America in many ways, you have to not only understand American history, immigration history, but I think you also have to understand Chinese history. And so it's a lot of scholars of the American West have looked at the American West. A lot of scholars of China have looked at China. Bringing the two together can help us get a more full, fully formed picture of these individuals and, and these trends and these movements. For instance, there's in chapter four, I look at something called the Chinese Empire Reform Association. And this, you have to know your Chinese history to understand what, what was happening with these groups. So for instance, uh, with the Dowager Empress receding from control and then the Guangxu Emperor taking over in about 1893-94, the Hundred Days of Reform and an attempt to westernize and modernize China, right? And then the, Guang, uh, the Dowager Empress retakes control, throws the Guang, Guangxu Emperor into house arrest. And the advisors who were advising him with the Hundred Days of Reform that China needed to westernize, modernize, uh, advance education, advance legal systems, those scholars who were advising the emperor were caught and beheaded, or a few of them escaped into exile. Those two who escaped into exile, Kang Ya Wei and Liang Chi Chao, for some on the program, I think you've never heard those names. For people who understand Chinese history, you know these names well. Kang Ya Wei and Liang Chi Chao come to Montana and they come and collaborate with 12 branches of the Chinese Empire Reform Association, one that had a militia in Butte that's training with live ammunition, training military tactics in Butte the place that had just tried to boycott and push them out with the threat of violence, then we have an armed Chinese militia in 1905, 1906. But if you don't understand Chinese history, you can't make sense of that story here. And so I think what then happens to a population that doesn't understand world history that well, the Chinese seem exotic and it's, it's, um, it's an exciting story to talk about opium dens. It makes people feel like here in Helena or Butte or Missoula or Billings or Bozeman, makes people feel like they're part of something secret if they think that that building over there used to be a Chinese brothel or that there's Chinese tunnels underneath this building. Or you know what really happened in, the, in that building? I think it makes people feel part of an exciting story that they're in on a secret and that flattens the experience of the true individuals who were part of this community. And, and so you allude to transnationalism um, and also the knowledge of what's happening on the US-China. Again, we think about transnationalism of Chinese Americans and also the bilateral relationship as a much more contemporary post-69 mm -hmm. post mm -hmm. uh, thread. But as you're suggesting, and Mocha feels the same way, these are threads that have existed for the entirety of this, of this journey. So the transnationalism, the back and forth, the 40 men to one woman and, and, and sort of the undesirable nature of marrying, what kind of, uh, sort of, if you can break down a little bit more, how much back and forth is going on? Um, not at that senior level, but like for men look, seeking wives in Toisan or whatever it may be. How, how do you, how would you gauge that? You know, are there frequent flyer miles going on here? <laughs> you know what I mean? There was much more back and forth than people imagine. So a flow of goods, letters, uh, funds, the, the, the remittances sent by people working here in a laundry in Helena or a, a restaurant in Butte, kept families alive in Taishan, in Toisan. Absolutely. Toisan was not in a good state in the late 19th century, causing one of the reasons for the push of migration out. But then the money earned here was life-saving for thousands of families in Southern China. And it was constantly going back and forth, usually through the Chinese mercantiles, the merchant exchanges here, where money would be sent, remittances would be sent, letters would be sent. And thankfully, the letters that were received from Toisan here are what we have with these two translation projects. We don't have the men writing from Butte back to family members because by definition they're in Southern China, those letters, right? But we know that the back and forth was frequent um, and that, that money was life-sustaining. The pressure on these men, mostly men working in Montana was extreme. 
send more money, send more money, send more money, come home and get married, send more money, come home and get married. That pressure to come home and get married was very real to produce descendants, to produce heirs, to venerate the ancestors, to carry on the family line was very real. So for instance, of the hundred letters we translated for chapter two, um, the gentleman is constantly implored from the 1880s through the 1920s to come home and get married. He, it was impossible for all intents and purposes for him to find a bride here in Montana. He was not a merchant, so he could not bring a wife in. Uh, so the only way for him to marry realistically was to go back to Southern China. I honestly think his, his immigration status, and we're not sure exactly his exact identity. I honestly think his immigration status was tenuous and he wanted to avoid port, ports and borders as much as possible. So he was sending as much money as he could home, but I think it was an impossibility for that gentleman to return and, and get married, unfortunately. Many did. Some merchants were able to bring their wives in before the 1882 act. Some workers were able to bring their wives in uh, and, and start families here in Helena and, and Butte for the most part. It was merchant families, Chinese families that became Chinese American family for, through birth. But even then, for Chinese women born in Montana, citizenship was immediate. But then when they got of a marrying age, if they married a non-citizen after 1907 with the Expatriation Act, they lost that American citizenship. So it's complicated and convoluted. And I, honestly, I think many on the call would agree, intentionally done so that Chinese American families did not take root through racist impressions here. You know, it's convoluted, um, but for some reason from the book, I feel that the Chinese were dealing with all of these restrictions they knew the conditions, if this, then that, if this, then that, in, in, in some of the letters, especially in chapter two. Um, there's definitely curiosity about how many Chinese Americans currently live in Montana, uh, but also Gary has a great question. You know, from the letters um, you sent from China, maybe from the ones that were unsent uh, from Montana, you know, what were the, you know, the, the other populations um, that are marginalized in Montana at this point? Was there concerns around Native Americans? Mm. Was there Netflix. Um, you don't talk too much about that in the book in terms of dedicated chapters, but I'm wondering if you can share a little bit about the, the climate of the population makeup at the time. Yeah, it was a very diverse population here in Montana, especially in Butte. Um, and I often, I almost think that it's the, the lowest rail type idea of, for immigrant communities. If there is one that's put upon more so, it elevates their status. So for immigrants who would be considered white, they were far more accepted into, into the community than Chinese immigrants. There was a rather large African-American community here, and there's been some important recent scholarship on that. Anthony Wood's book, I think of most especially for telling the, the Black history of Montana. Um, in terms of the native population, nothing rose specifically that is corroborated for Chinese and Chinese-American interactions with native peoples. There are some apocryphal stories that are often told in the white press. And what these would be is wagon trains coming up from Corinne, Utah, for instance, or coming over uh, the Cascade and Rocky Mountains from the West. Talk about Indian attacks, supposedly, quote, quoting the primary sources, where everybody would be killed except the Chinese who were on that wagon train. And almost imposing upon uh, the, the sources at the time the sense that the put upon indigenous population that's dealing with settler colonialism taking over here in Montana and the Chinese who are dealing with all the animosity had some sort of brotherhood and, and camaraderie. I didn't actually see that in the primary sources themselves, but a lot of times the white, uh, white controlled press would tell stories like that. So, and how many Chinese are living in Montana today? Like what happened to the population? Did they move east? That's a good question. So at, at its height, 2,500, more than 2,500 Chinese in about 1890. Uh, many of them passed on here, died here in Big Sky State, and their remains were buried and then exhumed and returned for reburial in Southern China as keeping with Chinese customs. I've got a chapter on that, on, on Chinese burial traditions. Many of them sadly were deported, especially from that period about 1903 to 1906, when teeth were given to that Gary Act. The Chinese population in Montana decreased by about 25% in a three-year span. And then many of them did move to Seattle, to San Francisco throughout the 1930s to 1950s. It reached its low point in the 1950s, the Chinese population in Montana, at just over 200. Now it's, it's much larger than that. Most of those are international students studying at Carroll College, at the University of Montana, at Montana State University, and places like that. In terms of 
Montana based Chinese families that have a connection back to that history, there's a handful, but nowhere near the numbers that we saw at the height of Montana's Chinese population. I really appreciate chapter six um, about uh, Chinese religious and burial practices that you mentioned, um, in part because we've heard a lot of stories um, of after the railroad, after the completion of the railroad, um, how you know, the PBS also reported it in their series, 100,000 pounds of remains were sent back to China. Um, and the Confucian sort of practice Chinese religious about, you know, ancestor worship, but also the importance of, of um, you know, respecting the, those practices. And yet the, you know, you have some incredible photos. So someone said, are there photos? Yes, and it's still by the book. He has incredible photos in there. Um, and the ones on the, in chapter six or on the burial practice and the funeral are particularly interesting as, we think about the importance of that for the family. Uh, can you share a little bit about um, what you found most interesting uh, in, in that practice? Did you know very much about the importance of the burial practice? And 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 we see we still see the importance of that in Chinatowns all across the country. Yeah, yeah. I, I didn't know a whole lot about it, and that's one of the reasons that I started this work in 2010. And this book just came out in May of 2022, right? Uh, yeah. Trying to, to to make myself as expert as I could and consult with people who had knowledge. I got to be honest, I'm a white guy from Great Falls, Montana, writing about this community that I'm not part of. Yes, I did live in Shanghai for eight years and have a lot of friends, but I needed to consult the sources and consult people with the cultural knowledge to help me dig into this more. So yeah, there's that picture of the burial in Missoula in 1891, and it's the first time it's been published, and it's fascinating. And white crowds, white Montanans were fascinated with Chinese burial practices. So they did make it into the newspaper quite often with the, the papers and the burning and the incense, right? There it is. And, and so Chinese burial practices were frequently reported on, but by a community that didn't understand what they were witnessing. So I try to look into the types of foods that were offered, the, the arrangement of the graves. We've actually got an, a project going on right now. There are 40 Chinese headstones, headstones with Chinese writing on them across Montana um, that have never before been translated. We've got a project funded by the Montana History Foundation to try and translate these from the traditional script. But then we have to be careful. A lot of times people have looked at one or two of these headstones and said, well, we can translate that into Mandarin. Well, there's no way that that individual who's buried there or was buried there spoke Mandarin. And so we wouldn't be able to get their name necessarily. So we've got the traditional language abilities to translate it and then to move that into Toi San Hua at Taishanese and try to identify and, and tell as much as we can about the people commemorated on, through these, these 40 headstones. What we're also trying to do is try and connect back to the villages indicated on those headstones in Southern China and Taishan, province, Taishan County and possibly connect with extended family members and try and bring this transnational story back together uh, in interesting ways in the 21st century for somebody that was maybe buried 140 years ago. Um, so uh, yeah, chapter six was, it took a long time to try and get the expertise to write that chapter. And it's got a lot about the Chinese burial practices and, and trying to illuminate that story, but also a celebration of Lunar New Year and how important that was for the Chinese communities in the large communities for instance, 650 Chinese in Helena definitely celebrated Chinese New Year in 1870, 71, 72. But then two gentlemen from Nyhart, Montana, made the 250 mile round trip to celebrate with their countrymen in March in Montana. It was uh, February or March that year to go through a spring, which is basically winter in Montana, to come together to celebrate to continue their cultures, to give themselves comfort and camaraderie and connection to a culture that seems so far away, gave them peace and stability in an otherwise too often hostile environment. Someone does have their hand raised. Why don't I take Miranda's question sure. um, and anyone else, please put your questions in the q and I can make sure I integrate them. And then we'll wrap up with a little bit about our teaser for when Mark comes to visit us in New York. But Miranda, did you, if we're able to, um, can we ask, invite Miranda to make a question if she still has it? Maybe not. Miranda, no? Um, okay, you can, Miranda, you can always put it in the uh, chat. Um, so chapter two, you talk about this, and what I love is this is a, a, a another, I don't know if this is the first published, but this is a map of Taisan Village, Toisan, in 1893 that Mark um, uh, places in the book. Um, We're so excited that Mark is going to join us on Tuesday, 
uh, election day, November 6th, 8th, uh, I think. November 8th, November 8th. So please look out for this program. And it's going to be very special because we'll be reading um, from these letters. Um, and again, you know, he alluded to how difficult it was to have these letters translated. You said the first round, only 30% of the letter was understood. And then, and then you had to go all to your complicated, you know, linguists in Taiwan and Hong Kong. And then finally you were able to, to uh, decode a lot of these letters, um, but particularly the brothers. Can you talk a little bit about the brothers? So the, the first collection of letters was 1880s to 1920s, kind of a traditional time period for the Chinese American, Chinese immigrant story. And we, we relied on parents, grandparents, families from Taiwan, families from Hong Kong who could read traditional script, people who were of a certain generation, so grandmothers and grandfathers. So it was a transnational intergenerational translation project that was just wonderful. 2012 is when we did that project for the 1880s to 1920s. I wrote grants to bring a group of researchers here to Helena while we had our translation team working in Shanghai and going back and forth. And through that process, another much larger collection of documents emerged. 250 documents from a completely different family from the 19 period 1930s to 1958, a different time period than is usually focused on in the telling of the Chinese story in the West. And these two brothers, one had entered Montana at the age of 14 in 1933, um, you know, many people know the mining history, and I alluded to that in Montana. Butte, Montana is called the richest hill on earth. It's got one of the largest copper stores in the world you know, underground, but the Chinese in Butte were prohibited from working in the underground mines in Butte. So this mining history that's so rich and this, we know that Chinese miners came in Butte, especially they were prohibited from that. This gentleman, Wing Hong Hum, is the first miner of Chinese ethnicity allowed to work in the Chinese in the in the underground mines in Butte. He gets that job in 1940, 1941, and there's some reasons for that. But he's making a life here in Butte, and he's desperately trying to get his brother Wing Goon out of war-torn southern China. War-torn, I'm sure people on the call know Chinese Civil War and interrupted by the Japanese invasion, Chinese Civil War uh, re-emerges. And so times were difficult down in Taishan. So the brother in Butte is desperately trying to get his brother from Southern China to join him in Montana. And they go through every step that the government requires and they are thwarted at every turn. Chinese exclusion should have ended in 1943, did in letter, but really what emerged after 1949 is a reassertion of Chinese exclusion in everything but name because of the Red Scare, because of the Cold War era. And so we see through the Cold War lens, these two brothers desperately trying to get back together, um, but thwarted by a fear of Chinese communist infiltration to the American West. So these letters go from 33, 48, 49, and then they, they basically continue throughout the 1950s. And uh, it's just this heart-rending story of two brothers trying to reunite, and it's complicated by global politics. Yeah, and, and that's what you referenced in the late part of the 19th century, that global politics, a bilateral relationship is constantly, consistently influencing uh, the livelihood and the life of uh, Chinese Americans in the country. These, um, so, so these letters, oh, I, was, I wanted to ask you because you mentioned the word copper um, and in, in the early part of the book, when you start telling the story, uh, there's a reference um, from, um, I'm sorry, who wrote this? Oh, in the Dimsdale newspaper. Yeah. Um, and they reference, you know, when they're referring to Chinese workers, they say they play sad havoc with the morals of the young females. The girls being in constant contact with the Chinese boys, they become imprudent and were ruined. It is sickening to think of beautiful white girls being seduced by these copper colored young scoundrels. I was really confused when I read that because we're talking about copper as the rare commodity here. Mm -hmm. And why would they use it as a description for these, you know, negative, you know, the, these Chinese who are these scoundrels. And obviously the word yellow hadn't really surfaced as much until later, but. It's a good question. So this is a, uh, an immigrant himself, Thomas Dimsdale, immigrant from England, was the editor of Montana's first newspaper and also was Montana's first secretary of education. And he's writing this racist, <laughs> right? Um, and, um, this, but this is in the 1860s. So copper had not yet become mm. an important commodity until electrification in the later, later century. So right. when copper is needed for the, the electrical grid of the nation and the world, then Montana copper basically electrifies New York City and, and everywhere else. Um, 
so he's definitely playing on the different color and the race element of things and that threat of Chinese men despoiling white women. I mean, we know this whole yellow peril and Jack Chen's work is just so important on that with, with his connection to Mocha. But he goes further. Thomas Dimsdale goes further in this. He, he says what you just said, but he's writing about relationships that are happening in California, implying though that we need to avoid that in Montana. He goes further and he says this, is there no hemp in California? Saying, if that were to happen in Montana, we know how we would solve that problem in his words at the time, and it would be through lynching. Now, Montana has, at its earliest days of non-native settlement, has a lynching history that is very interesting, quite violent, very rarely race-based. So it's not like lynchings of the American South necessarily, but it's vigilante, quote unquote, justice at the time before a functioning legal system had taken hold in this frontier society. So Dimsdale to say, is there no hemp in California to solve your Chinese problem is indicating to his readers in Montana what he thinks should be done with the Chinese in Montana. So then I go, I go 30 years ahead when the Chinese in Butte are marching with live ammunition with guns and forming a militia. How bold, how strong, how cheeky is that for them to take that stance against a too often hostile uh, neighbor community? Yeah, I, I love the this, the reference to the Chinese Reform, the Empire Reform Association, and, and how you break that out so much, as well as your sections and references to six companies and the Chinese Consolidated Benevolent Association. I really feel like it's an incredible supplement to what we already understand about the CCBA and CERA. Um, you know, we've talked a little bit about their their um, you know the, the the challenges that the Chinese Americans had to deal with predominantly men. Uh, we've talked a little bit about you know the derogatory terminology that they had to deal with, but also um, their their pivoting and their enterprising. Steve Chow has a great question. He said, like, basically, who's advocating? You know, how can they possibly understand all the laws and all the intricacies? Mm -hmm. There's language barriers. I'm sure the CCBA did as good a job they, back then as they do today in terms of providing social services and abilities and skills and connectivity. But who are the Americans or the non-Chinese Americans who are really willing to help these 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 individuals that's a great question that's a great question there weren't many but some of them who did stand up were quite powerful there's a gentleman named wilbur fisk sanders one of the founding fathers of montana one of the vigilante founding fathers of montana who took the law into his own hands in 1864-65 to try and bring order in their in their view to a lawless society wilbur fisk sanders go on, goes on to be a u.s senator very very powerful in that 1896-97 boycott where the chinese in butte fought against the boycott through the legal system they employ wilbur fisk sanders as their lawyer and so they do have white allies at key moments um, for instance another another good example is in 1885 1885 is a horrible year to be chinese in the american west the rock springs massacre the expulsion from tacoma the expulsion from seattle Things were not good. There were threats of similar violence throughout Montana's towns, Dillon, Deer Lodge, Butte, Anaconda, Missoula, places were threatening and trying to boycott, mostly a Knights of Labor based American labor boycott. In Deer Lodge, Montana, the white city fathers, when a notice had been put up that a boycott was about to be instituted against Deer Lodge's Chinese, the white city fathers said, no, not here. And 80 of them signed their name saying, we will not stand for this boycott against the Chinese in Deer Lodge. The boycott notice had been anonymous. And so for the white city fathers and 80 white neighbors in, in Deer Lodge to stand up and sign their name and say, not here, was bold. I don't think they had any love for their Chinese neighbors. What they had is more of an adherence to the American legal system saying, if this boycott could be instituted against somebody just because they're Chinese, What's next? Could it be instituted against an Irish person, against a Catholic, against different groups? So they saw that that was a slippery slope, but they stood up for the Chinese when it counted. And thankfully, I think that combination of white allies in key moments, plus an empowered, active, uh, strong Chinese community is likely one of the main reasons why there was not that moment of bloodshed against the Chinese in Montana. Hey, you found more Chinese from Montana because Demetra just made a wonderful comment that said that her family's three to four generation of descendants from Butte. And yep. then she never understood why her grandma was born there. Yeah. Um, and you know why her father, a physician who went to USC Med, um, worked there. 
And, you know, I, we hear these stories a lot. Um, John Day, Oregon, you know, we've heard of stories of families going back and preserving some heritage, but th th those communities have so few Chinese Americans living there today. And it's hard to believe that they were the second largest XYZ at a time when there was 20% population. Um, but she also re references that her father was English was like, shockingly good. And while the judges kept accusing him of being a laborer to deny his visa, mm. he kept stating he was a physician. He yep. never went back to Canton. Oh, thank you so much for making that comment. Um, and also, I wonder, I wonder if her if her relative there was Wajin Lam, who who gained was the first Chinese person to gain a a, a medical degree from USC. Ooh. Yep. 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 I, I, fe I feature yes. him, his yes. wife, their story. Yes. In yeah. chapter six, in I'm sorry, chapter book. seven. Yeah. <laughs> Get yeah. the book, the information's in the in the chat. Um, that's wonderful. And then there was uh, another great, great, yes, that's your grandfather. Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm, mm, I'm so happy. Ha have you heard of, Joyce wants to know, a shipwreck? Uh, I guess, Robert, well, I don't remember from the book, 1874, the SS Japan? No, no. 391 Chinese people. I don't know mm -hmm. if it has any relationship to Butte, um, Joyce, but yeah, I haven't, I don't remember referen the, the reference of it in the book, but maybe something to look into. Robert Well told this okay. story. The, the only shipwreck I know of that connects to the story, that gentleman I mentioned, uh, Wing Hong Hum, who came to Butte in, in 1933 at the age of 14, the ship that he and his uncle came over to that docked in Seattle, and they were held in detention in Seattle for six weeks as their stories were checked and double-checked. The ship that they landed on, on I think May 4th, 1933, sank in, in Puget Sound the next day. No connection, total coincidence, but it was a, kind of an interesting headline to, to come across that. And, you know, May 4th is a big day in Chinese history. What's going right. on? Um, uh, Neil put the uh, purchase information in the chat and Mark has generously been able to find us a 40% discount. So it's a perfect Thanksgiving Day present. Yeah, <laughs> so, yeah. Um, but I wanted to also just remind everyone, so so come out, we're going to uh, talk a little bit uh, with Mark in person, uh, where right now we're creating the program, it's probably going to be two parts. Uh, we're trying to think about taking some of his incredible skills, having taught in Shanghai, and with young people looking at that uh, perspective, uh, to perhaps do a workshop with high school students, um, and think about ways that they can take primary resources as he did in his class um, and some of the letters that we you know, um, have, have, have read through, through in this book and then maybe bring them to create um, some sort of dialogue around that. And then in the evening, a program that will be in person uh, that started a new, that's continuing an initiative that MOC is focusing on, which is storytelling, uh, performance and community building. Um, so we'll be reading live letters, um, and we're going to decide which letters are such an incredible um, uh, wealth of uh, primary resources in these letters. But we'll bring those stories to life um, by doing a, a stage reading of those letters with professional actors and maybe some of the high school students as well. Um, but we'll provide more details. Look out for that. Um, and also another um, aspect, we have another program coming up. It's in the chat. Neil has on there. We're talking a little bit more into the food space. Um, and also a really exciting element is uh, we are doing our um, back by popular demand an original production by the museum called Double Happiness, which is a dinner and show, a 10 course meal, an original play written by Emily Locke. And uh, it should be great. You may probably saw something in your inbox around that. We only have four runs of the show, um, but it's coming up at the end of September, beginning of October. Um, but most importantly, this is one of the best books I've read um, on Chinese America, and it is so well researched. And it's it creates the you know what we experience today in a conversation with Mark is the scholarship around uh, the work that he conducted. But what we'll be able also to see when we see him in person, November eighth, are the primary resources where you were able to thread together so much of this. It's almost like detective work. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, you know, Mark, thank you for contributing to, you know, to this work. Um, Mocha knows that there are over 30 historical museums that cover this, this narrative um, and that we're working really hard to make sure that it's included um, in the textbooks. But we can't do the work that you're doing because this would, you know, this is, this is tough, tough, tough work. Um, so any last thoughts about um, your book or anything you want to share before we close our event? I, I'm just humbled to be a small part of bringing these stories to light. I'm glad that you enjoyed the book. It is an academic press, but I think I, I hope it's written in a way that highlights these stories and just highlights the drama and the strength and resilience 
of the people who are um, humble to try and tell their stories. So to add a little piece to our greater understanding of Chinese American history, Asian American history, American history, world history has been my great pleasure. I'm glad to partner with MOCA. I'm happy to speak to schools and different museums across the nation. I travel frequently. So if anybody would like to get in touch and, and work on creative ways to collaborate, I'm open for that. And this is going to make you happy. Julie just commented that she has a Chinese daughter in Helena and she was born in Butte. Yeah. And, and my mother is a little girl. Ah, great, great, great. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, thank you so much again, Mark. And thank you for everyone who joined us. And, you know, if you're interested in this type of programming, just continue to let us know. And we will definitely try to stream that for you, Julie, um, for the November event with Mark. Um, and thanks everyone for being a part of our community. We are so grateful for every one of you and your stories. So have a good night, Mark. Thank you so much. Thank you, Nancy. Thank you, everyone. A thank you, thank you bag in the mail. <laughs> All right, great.